so glad to be with you this morning. I want to welcome you to Trinity Bible Church of Dallas. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, we're so excited that you're here. If you can scoot in, we're going to have a full house this morning. I want to, we want to make sure everybody's got a seat. We are going to begin our service by standing and singing the doxology together. So stand with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come this morning to gather corporately as a local body to worship you, to give you the praise and the thanks for what you have done for each one of us individually, that you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for sinners like us. L Lord, your people are the most to be blessed. And Lord, we come this morning with gratitude for what you have done for us. So I pray that you would help us this morning. I pray, Lord, that as your word is read, it would go out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that it would affect each and every one of us exactly where we are. Lord, give us a zeal. Draw us closer to you. I pray that you would bless Matt as he preaches this morning, that you would give him great boldness and joy. I pray, Lord, that you would use him as an instrument, that, that Lord, what he says would be pleasing and acceptable to you this morning. Lord, we pray that as we remember the Lord's Supper at the end of the service, that you would direct our hearts and our minds to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has specifically done for us. Lord, there's many needs in this body. You know what the needs are. Those that are sick, those that are in financial need, Lord, those that are in distress, we pray that you would meet the need according to your will. And the greatest need is that of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if there's someone here this morning who does not know Christ, somebody watching, we pray, Lord, if you be willing that today would be the day of salvation, that you would open the eyes, that you would circumcise the heart, that you would cause new birth, Lord, that you would give the gift of faith and repentance. We ask all these things in Christ's name, amen. Have a seat. Again, if you can scoot in, we still have people coming in. If you are visiting with us for the very first time, we have a gift for you, a MacArthur Study Bible. They're white. They're just in the lobby over there. Please grab one. We want to make sure that everyone has a Bible. If you have a bulletin, I want to call your attention to the meetings this week. The first one is today for the high school kickoff. It will be down the street in Mockingbird Station at Pure Milk and Honey Ice Cream Shop. Uh, Christian and Al Jean will be there. Parents, you're invited to come. That'll happen as soon as the service is over at 1130 this morning. This Thursday morning, September 1st, Mommy Meetup. It's from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's the new time during the fall. That'll be at Flagpole Hill in Dallas. If you have any questions about that, please contact Heather. Her information's in the bulletin. We're excited that next Wednesday, the women's Bible study will start again. There will be a morning session and an evening session. It's here. Uh, the study will be on the book of Habakkuk.
Ladies, if you have not done it before and you're interested, please contact Ashley Joseph at admin at trinitybibledallas.org, and we'll get you all the information on that. In two, in two weeks, on September the 11th, we are starting two services. I announced it last week. First service will be at 8 o'clock to 9.15. We are starting Sunday school again during the fall. That'll start at 9.30 to 10.30. We've got a new class for young marrieds that will meet across the, across the driveway in the building next door. Um, if you have not been attending a Sunday school class, I would encourage you to come. It's been a wonderful time. The second service will be at 1045 to noon. I said it last week, sort of joking, sort of not. When you're done coming to church, if you come to the first service and Sunday school because of the parking, we need you to leave. I know you want to sit and talk to each other, but we need to make sure that everybody's got an opportunity to get in and park and come to the service. Austin Duncan will be with us that Sunday, so just note that. Uh, the schedule's changed a little bit. And that is all I have. Our first hymn this morning is Glorious Day. It's number 212 in the hymnal. Uh -huh. 
in Hebrews 2, 73, Jesus can be your apostle. I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. Uh, lyrics are by Kathleen Thomerson, and this is an arrangement by Tom Trenny. <laughs> 
wonderful. It's a tough act to follow. Excuse us, we'll get these out of the way. Yeah, no, no worries. Well, I'm tickled uh, that I didn't have to preach last week. <laughs> Kevin, uh, Kevin lost in a game of uh, rock, paper, scissors. I didn't know if you knew. That's how we figure out who's going to teach. But, uh, and, and I know, Kevin, there was a bunch of us, uh, a bunch of men out this week like me trying to find a bigger basket for their bicycle. So I'm not sure where <laughs> Kevin is, but I didn't, I didn't realize that. But that's good to know. So uh, we are in... Uh, Genesis chapter 37. So if you have your Bible, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. And this is an exciting Sunday because this is the beginning of the Joseph narrative. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Paul Twist has done his doctrinal study on this. So the, the, the Joseph narrative is a wonderful narrative and we'll be in this until the end of the book. So it is a great study that we're about to embark in. We've also, we've obviously had a great time going through the first 36 chapters of Genesis, but we're going to be in Genesis chapter 37 this morning, and we're looking at verses 1 to 11. Genesis 37, verses 1 to 11. So if you have your Bible, please join me as I read. Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all the sons because he was the son of his old age and he had made him a very colored tunic. And his brothers saw that his father loved him more than all his brothers. And so they hated him. And they could not speak to him on friendly terms. Verse 5. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf rose up and stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheep. And then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule over us? And so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream and he related it to his brothers and said, lo, I have had still another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And he related it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you've had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Let's go to the author and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this journey that we've had in the book of Genesis. We thank you for this morning and this text in chapter 37 and these first few verses. We come upon holy ground this morning as we open your word. And we ask that you would teach us from this text. We thank you that you have condescended to make yourself known in a book. And that you have written through 44 authors and given us 66 books. And it's a love letter to your people. It's a, a way of telling us about yourself, but it's also a way of telling us about ourselves. And so, Father, we don't take this lightly that we come before you this morning to study your word. It is inspired, it is infallible, it is inerrant, and it is holy. We thank you for it. And we ask that you would elevate the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that he would increase and that I would decrease, and that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I alluded to earlier, this is my favorite part of the book of Genesis, the Joseph narrative. As you probably have in your Bible, there are certain texts that are like an old pair of slippers. All of the scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and rebuking and training and righteousness. But there are certain texts as we go through our Bibles that just give us more comfort than others. And I find that I come back to the Joseph narrative either in text or in my mind 
thinking about these things as I go through life. We learn so much from Joseph as we walk through these chapters in Genesis. It's a wonderful picture of the story of redemption. Joseph going on ahead of his brothers to prepare a way to save a nation. We learn about the reversal of fortunes. Just like God did with Samuel's parents, he can reverse a fortune in our lives. We know that Joseph goes from the outhouse to the penthouse. He goes from the dungeon after two years and with a shower and a shave, he's second in command of Egypt. We learn about the fact that God can transform lives. We see Judah, who is arguably the ringleader in the wickedness that we'll see in this chapter and beyond, being totally transformed and becoming the one who would bring, bring, bring forth Messiah as the tribe of Judah. And we see the, the substitution that we find in the cross with the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that Joseph was a man who stood in the gap for his people. And so we, we learned so much from Joseph as we walk through this narrative. But the, the reason that it's my favorite part of the book is because of really three things. Number one, I think it's one of the greatest sections of Scripture to teach us about the providence of God. The providence of God. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the providence of, providence of God, this is simply God's sovereign plan and how it's worked out. So God has decreed a plan, and the how that gets worked out is God's providence. And so we see God's invisible hand as he weaves through this narrative with Joseph saving a nation for himself. Number two, we see that Joseph prospered wherever he was planted. Didn't matter whether he was thrown into a ditch and sold to the Midianites or left for dead in the prison and forgotten by the butler and the baker. Joseph was a man who God's hand was on because Joseph never took his eyes off the Lord, regardless of the circumstances. And then third, we see above all things that God works all things for good for those who love him. God works all things for good for those who love him. No matter how bad things got for Joseph, no matter what happened to him, God was orchestrating it all for his good and for the salvation of a nation. In fact, the book culminates with a great text in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. When Joseph, standing before his brothers after making himself known, says this, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And as students of the scriptures, we often find that there is Old Testament texts that are manifested in the New Testament. Elijah multiplying the loaves is a wonderful picture of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And we see here in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, these words that Joseph says are almost verbatim what Paul says in Romans 8, 28, a verse that all of us hold dear. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so this morning, as we look at just the first 11 verses of this chapter, I've entitled this message, Joseph, a love-hate relationship. Joseph was a man who was dearly loved. He was loved by his father. He was loved by the Lord God. But Joseph was also a man who was vehemently hated by his own family, his brothers. And so I thought because we're starting this long narrative, we needed to spend a little time taking a little overview of the Joseph narrative. This narrative begins with more discussion about the dysfunctional family of Jacob. We've already seen much of that dysfunction up until this chapter, but we see more dysfunction here, a lot of dysfunction in chapter 37. The record of Joseph is the same length as the record of Abraham, 14 chapters. So when we read our Bible, we need to give things context. We don't want to give it more importance than the scriptures give it, but we certainly don't want to give it less importance than the scriptures give a subject. And so we have 14 chapters on Abraham, so too 14 chapters on Joseph. But what's interesting is there's 25% more content on the life of Joseph because he is such a great type of Christ. Genesis 37 begins with 12 sons, 12 sons. And these sons, as we know, will become the future patriarchs of Israel. And it ends with 70 in the nation, which is the number of perfection. And so that's 
the journey that we'll see as this nation grows. God is fulfilling his purpose to Abraham, which we saw all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, that he was going to give them a land and he was going to give them a seed. And so we see he's been multiplying and providing and, and, and taking care of that promise that he gave to Abraham through Isaac and now through the family of Jacob. And so as Kevin said last week, things are not always as they seem. And as I read through those first few verses in chapter 37, and really as you read through the whole chapter in 37, what strikes you is the number of times that the word Joseph is mentioned. Obviously, he's a prominent figure in this chapter. Joseph is mentioned 13 times in chapter 37. We also see that the the name of his brothers or the word brothers is mentioned 21 times in chapter 37. And as you're studying your Bible, words that are repeated give you many times the key to the text. And so we see Joseph and his brothers are prominent in this chapter. We also see Jacob being prominent. Jacob is mentioned 15 times. Now he's called three things. He's called Jacob, he's called Israel, and he's also referred to as father. And so certainly Joseph and his brothers and Jacob are all very prominent in this chapter. But we would be remiss if we didn't zoom out and understand the real key to this text and who really is the most prominent. And that's the Lord God. You see, the Lord God is the one who's behind these two dreams. The Lord God is the one who brings the revelation of what will happen to this family and ultimately to the nation of Israel. And what's fascinating is you don't see the word Lord or God in this chapter. And so while he's not mentioned, he is the one who brings the two dreams. He is the one who will move the story, not just in chapter 37, but all the way through chapter 50. And so his invisible hand is moving throughout this narrative for the next 14 chapters. And he's the one who is knitting together this tapestry, despite all of the things that go wrong from a human perspective to ultimately save a nation and preserve the seed of Messiah that will ultimately produce the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that the psalmist in Psalm 105 gives us a divine commentary on what's about to take place. Psalm 105, starting in verse 16, is either written probably by Asaph or David, says this, and he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They forced his feet into shackles, and he was put in irons. Here it is, verse 19. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord refined him. Now, if you would have asked Joseph if he would have gone on ahead a different way, certainly he would have. But this was all part of the divine plan of the Lord that Joseph would be prepared when the famine came to preserve his family. And so the point in these few verses this morning is that man is utterly lost unless he has the revelation of God. That book that you hold in your hand is a treasure because God has revealed himself to man in a special way. Man will never be saved through creation. It's only through the special revelation of God that man understands not only who he is, and lays us bare, but who God is. And so revelation is critically important. That's why Calvin begins his institutes with the fact that wisdom really comes down to two irreducible minimums, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self. And so revelation, that's why every catechism, the 1689 and every other catechism begins with God's revelation. Because unless God speaks, man is completely lost. And so let's look at verse 1. I know Kevin touched on this last week. He was gracious enough to call me and ask if he could get on my lawn. I said, look, you can mow the grass, you can, you can edge it, and you, you plant flowers, whatever you want to do. Because we know that the scriptures are inspired, but the, the, the chapter marks are not. These are man-made. So there's occasions, as we know in the Bible, where really a chapter break comes a little early or a little late. The end of John chapter 2, for example, is a little late. Genesis chapter 36 really should end with verse 1 in chapter 37. So let's look at verse 1 quickly. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had lived as a stranger 
in the land of Canaan. This is really to bring a contrast, as we saw last week, with the nation of Esau or Edom and the generations of Jacob. And so the stranger here that is mentioned in verse, in verse 1, Jacob lived as a stranger in the land of Canaan. Some of you in your translations have the word sojourner. But the, con the concept is very simple. It's that he was a temporary resident. He was a temporary resident. While Esau was building kingdoms and kings and chiefs and putting down roots in this world like Lot had, or rather Enoch had earlier in this book, Jacob was sojourning like his father Abraham and Isaac had. And we see this in the author to the Hebrews in chapter 11. He says this in verse 9. By faith, he, speaking of Abraham, lived as a stranger. Same, same word in the Greek, Septuagint. In the land of promise, as a foreigner in the land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise, he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And the same is true for us today as believers. We're sojourning through this world. We're in the world. We're not of the world. We're not to be making our home here. We are looking forward to the heavenly home. Jesus says in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come back and receive you to myself. And so Moses is declaring here in verse 1 that Jacob is now the sole possessor of Canaan. Enon has been, en Esau rather, has been moved off the field, and sole possession now belongs to Jacob in Canaan. And Esau, as we saw last week, was a man who had incredible material blessing, but he was utterly bankrupt spiritually. He was blessed materially, but bankrupt spiritually. And we have the final record in Obadiah. The prophet Obadiah tells us later how the whole story with Edom and Esau ends, and it's not a pretty sight. He says in verse 17 of chapter 1, Obadiah says this, and the house of Jacob will possess their property. So not only did Esau gain the world, he lost the thing that he gained while he was here. The house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be like stubble and they will set on fire and consume them so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau for the Lord has spoken. And that's a sober warning for all of us here this morning. Perhaps there's someone here who is like Esau. You've been spending your life accruing the things of the world materially. And Jesus says, what good does it gain a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his own soul? That was what Esau did. And so as we come to verse 2, I've broken this into three parts, and I, I, I sort of look at it as acts on a play. So we have act 1, verses 2 through 4. Act 1 verse 2 through 4. Look at verse 2. These are the records of Jacob. Joseph, when he was 17 years of age, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. And while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now, this word records in Hebrew is literally the idea that these are the account of Jacob's generations. And so we know the book of Genesis is about generations. We've seen this before with other men. And now we see the generations of Jacob. And that's really what we're going to be talking about from chapter 37 to chapter 50 is the generations, the family line of Jacob as it's passed down from Abraham and Isaac. So Moses introduces us for the first time to Joseph. And he says that Joseph is a shepherd boy of 17 years of age. And so it's it's easy for us to think about last Sunday in Genesis chapter 36, and we have to contrast, we know the Bible is a book of contrast, we contrast this young shepherd boy of 17 with all of what we saw in chapter 36. Here is Esau with the kings and the chiefs and the mighty men and all that he had, and the hopes of Israel in chapter 37 rest upon who? A young 17-year-old shepherd boy. And so Joseph, as we know, was a servant of the Lord. And so God is going to do great things through this 17-year-old shepherd boy because he had his eyes, as I said earlier, fixed upon the Lord. James Boyce said this in his commentary, quote, the greatest single characteristic of Joseph was his absolute faithfulness to God under all circumstances. It is through this 
that God worked to exalt him so highly. And we see this in other places in the scripture, right? David was a, a young, ruddy shepherd boy who was the youngest of his family, and yet God did, great thing, God did great things through David, and he made him a king through trial and dodging spears and being in the wilderness, ultimately to become the king of Israel. And so Joseph was the first son of Rachel, for whom Jacob had worked 14 years. We know that Jacob had a tremendous love for Rachel. That was the apple of his eye in verse 20 in chapter 29. We looked at this weeks ago that he worked for these 14 years, and it seemed like a very short time because of his great love for her. And so it's no surprise that Joseph would be one of the favorite, if not the favorite son, because of his love for his mother. And now I think it's important that we stop for a second and think about the character that was developed within Joseph because of what we find later in his life. Jo Joseph's character was developed at a young age because of all the things that had happened. First, we no doubt would have uh, understood that Jacob would have taught him about the angelic vision that Jacob had. Remember when Jacob was putting his head that night on a rock and he saw a vision of Jacob's ladder coming between heaven and earth, a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his mediation. Jacob would have told Joseph about that and how God had provided for him and God had covenanted with him. And so he would have learned from that. Jacob was fleeing from Laban in haste. And I'm sure that at some point in somewhere in the group, Joseph would have been bouncing on the back of a camel probably in great haste as he was running from Uncle Laban. And he would have learned about the danger that his father was in. And then there came the anxiety with Esau and all the 400 men marching toward them. Imagine being a 12 or 13 year old boy and here comes Esau with his 400 men and you see the anxiety in your father, Jacob. And that would have certainly had an impact upon his character. And then I'm sure when Jacob came limping over the fort of Javok, he would have said, hey, hey, dad, why are you limping? What happened? And Jacob would have recounted the night that he wrestled with the Lord. And he would have taught him about that. And he would have found out about his sister, Dinah, who had been brutally raped in Shechem. And then he saw his brothers go and destroy a city in anger and murdering the Shechemites. And that would have had a tremendous impact upon a young teenager. And then his mother dies, giving, child, or giving birth to his, uh, his other brother, Benjamin. So he gained a brother and he lost a mother. It would have been a tremendous impact upon his character. And then finally, he watches as his grandfather Isaac is buried in the cave of Machpelah. And we know that that had such an impact upon him because 27 years later, at the end of this book in Genesis, he says, hey, when I die, take me back there and bury me. Don't bury me in Egypt. And so all of these things would have shaped Joseph's character. And I think the lesson for all of us here this morning is you may be young, you may be old, but all of the things that God has used in your past, he's done to develop your character. And he can use that greatly for his good and for his glory. And so we see that Joseph while he was out with his brothers, brought back a bad report. Now, if we're honest, I think this narrative sort of rubs us a little bit the wrong way. We often think of, and I'll speak maybe for myself, is Joseph is maybe a goody two-shoes here, or he's a little bit of a tattletale. But I think really the reality of this text is that this is more truth-telling than it is tattletelling. Joseph is bringing a report back to his father, and we'll explain here where I'm going. Given his appointed position. He had been appointed by his father to be in this position. This was part of his job, was to give a report about his brothers. No different than David had when he went to the front lines to see how his brothers were doing. And so he's doing this in obedience to his father. And the other thing it does is it introduces us to the character flaws in his brothers. We're introduced for the first time, and we saw it in Shechem and other places, but we're introduced again to the fact that these brothers have a real character flaw and are wicked. And the irony is that they're going to try to destroy Judah, or they're going to try to destroy Judah is his brother Joseph, who's the only means of future salvation. That's the irony in verse 27. Later in this chapter, you can see verse 27 in chapter 37 here. He says, let us not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother. 
And so he's saying, well, let's not kill him. He's our brother. We'll just sell him and throw him into a ditch. And they're trying to destroy the very one who would be ultimately their savior. And so Joseph is, is not recorded, as we know, with any flaws in the, in the divine text. Obviously, he had a sin nature, but the Lord does not record any of his flaws. And so he's a, he's a person who is endeared to us because he is such a type of Christ in this narrative. And look at verse 3. It says that Israel loved Joseph more than all his brothers because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a multicolored tunic. Now, notice that he doesn't use the word Jacob here. He calls him Israel. He calls him Israel. Now, there's a lot of ink that's been spilled on why he changes the name here from Jacob to Israel. And I won't bore you with the different ideas, but I'll give you two, which I think are important. Number one, Israel in the narrative in Genesis is typically used when it's referred to the head of the family, as it is here. And so Israel is referenced to the head of the family. Jacob is often used when Moses is talking about divine, or human weakness. So when Jacob is exercising human weakness, he typically uses the name Jacob. Secondly, the scene here is Joseph is present. So when Joseph is in the narrative and he's present, typically Moses will use the word Israel, the name Israel. And when Joseph is not, he will use the name Israel. Jacob. And so that's probably why Moses switches here and uses Israel. But it says that he loved Joseph more than all his sons. And you remember two or three weeks ago when Andrew Curry was here, he talked about the fact that this family had an issue with favoritism. You remember that about three weeks ago, that this family had an issue with favoritism. Isaac loved Esau more than Jacob, despite God's design. Rebecca loved Jacob more than Esau. And Jacob, we just talked about, loved Rachel more than Leah. And so obviously that love of Rachel has now been transferred to his son, Joseph. And so, yes, as parents, we need to take a stop and say, okay, favoritism is something that we need to be very, very careful about. I'm fascinated by the families that I know and even our family that two parents can produce two or three children and they can all be very different. Same parents different kids. So we need to love them in a different way, but we need to love them equally. And so favoritism is something that we need to be very careful of as parents. But I don't think that's really the, the, the point of the text here. This multicolored tunic is not about favoritism. It's not about Jacob showing favoritism to the brothers. I think better this multicolored tunic, and the Hebrew is ambiguous from all the men that that I've read, this Hebrew is really more a full-length garment. That's probably the better translation of this text. Not a multicolored tunic, but a full-length garment. And the point is this. In that day, those who labored wore short tunics, sleeveless, and they stopped at their, at their uh, thigh because they were involved in labor, in manual labor. Those who wore full-length garments that came down to their wrists and all the way down to their ankles were those who were favored position. They didn't do manual labor. So the idea here is that Joseph was given this favored position by his father Jacob, and he was the one who wore the long robe. And so it was just a visible symbol to the brothers of another source of hatred. Now, how did he get this favored position? Well, if you remember back in Genesis 35, verse 22, Reuben slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah. You remember that? Reuben slept with Bilhah. And so as the firstborn, he forfeited, because of that, he forfeited his birthright. Just like Esau had forfeited his birthright for a bowl of stew. And so back in that day, when the firstborn forfeited their birthright, it was the father's prerogative to exercise his sovereign choice of who would take over that birthright. Now, I did not know that until this week. And so Jacob was well within the confines of then taking his sovereign choice of Joseph as the apple of his eye. And so that is why he gave him this garment. And that is the real meaning, I think, behind this text and this coat. And so he exercises preeminence over his brothers because he doesn't have to perform the labor. And that is a testimony, that cloak was a testimony to his father's love. Verse 4 says, His brothers saw that their father loved him more than his brothers, and so they hated him 
and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Now, I want you to notice in verse 4, this concept of they hated him is repeated in rapid succession. Look at verse 4, they hated him. Verse 5, they hated him. And in verse 8, they hated him. And it's indication of the intensity of the hatred that they had for their brother Joseph. The intensity of the hatred. The Hebrew here is to hate someone, and it literally has the idea of a strong emotion that doesn't want to have anything to do with that person. In fact, in verse 20, later in this chapter, we know that the hatred is so strong that they talk about murdering their own brother. Murdering their own brother, just as we saw earlier in Genesis with Cain and Abel. And so it's a strong warning here that we need to be very careful to guard our hearts against hate. Jesus, as we know, in the Sermon on the Mount said, you don't need to commit the act. You can murder someone within your heart. And so the idea here was that they hated him so much in verse 4, they could not even speak to him. Literally, they didn't even want to greet him. They wanted nothing to do with him. And so it's a warning for us. The author to the Hebrews in chapter 12 says this, verse 15, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by many, and by, and by because of it, many become defiled. And so we need to guard our hearts against those things that cause a root of bitterness. And there's many things in our lives, right, that could rise up and cause, cause bitterness. So we need to guard against that. James Boyce says this, the brothers hated Joseph because he was not like them. They stood for treachery, murder, and incest, and he stood for truth. So as long as he was present, his virtue exposed their vice. And so we see the same thing in the New Testament with Christ and the Pharisees. Every time the Pharisees saw the Lord Jesus Christ, his virtue exposed their vice. And so we see it here with the brothers. And now we look at, now we look at Act 2, verses 5 through 8. Here's the second act of this section we're looking at. Look at verse 5. Then Joseph had a dream, and when it was told to his brothers, here it is again, they hated him even more. Now, I think Dr. Lawson said this a month or two ago, and it's very instructive, at least it was for me. We need to understand the difference between dreams and visions. A dream is something that happens while a man is asleep. We saw that earlier in the book of Genesis. A vision is something that happens when a man is awake. And so, obviously, we're talking here about a dream. But either way, it's a means of God's divine revelation. It's a means of God's divine re revelation. The very beginning of the book of Hebrews, the author tells us that God, in various ways and in various portions, spoke to the men of old. But today, he speaks to us through his word, the Lord Jesus Christ. So God doesn't give visions or dreams today. He speaks to us through the Bible that you hold in your hand. So these two dreams at the beginning of the account do one thing. They affirm God's sovereign plan. These two dreams in rapid succession affirm God's sovereign plan. But because of these dreams, it says in verse 5, they hated him even more. They hated him even more. And the point is this. The reason that they hated Joseph was because they hated God's revelation. And the reason that they hated God's revelation is because they hated the God of that revelation. We need to stop and remember that. It wasn't Joseph as much as it was the revelation. And ultimately, if you boil it down, it was the God of that revelation that they hated. Let us not forget the root of all sin is ultimately against who? God. David said, against you and you only have I sinned. Later, when Joseph is running from Potiphar's wife, he says, how could I sin and do this against her? No, against God. And so these men could not stand the revelation of God because light dispels the darkness. And so it is today. Men hate the Bible because it exposes who they are. God's revelation lays them bare, as the author to the Hebrews says. It's the one before whom we have to do. And so men hate the darkness rather than the light. So there's nothing new under the sun. And so this is the first of three pairs of two dreams. 
So there's going to be three sets of two dreams later in the book of Genesis. And this is the first of those two. And these are the only two that are dreamed by Joseph himself. You'll remember later he's going to interpret the other two sets of dreams, but these are two that came to him. You look at verse 6 and verse 7. It says, He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf stood up and also remained standing. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Well, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what he was talking about, right? I mean, the, the interpretation of the dream was obvious. Eventually, his brothers, who all were older except for one, were going to bow down to Joseph in worship. And as we know, this prophecy is fulfilled later in the book, and his brothers do bow down to, to Joseph. And they, and they not only do it once, they do it multiple times. And so the lesson is that God hates Man hates the word of God. Without the eyes of faith, without the gift of faith, man cannot understand the revelation of God. And so he tells them these dreams, the brothers don't understand, and they hate them all the more. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says this about the natural man. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. This is why Jesus said a man must be born again. He must be spiritually reborn before he can understand spiritual truth. And so it was with them. In verse 8, And then his brother said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule over us? And so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And by rejecting Joseph, his brothers are doing what? They're rejecting Joseph. God's sovereign plan. And so I think the question for us this morning is, is there someone here who is rejecting the word of God and has rejected the only means of salvation that's been afforded them by God? Have we rejected the word of God and the means of salvation that God has given in his book? You're cutting yourself off from the very thing that these brothers were trying to cut themselves off from. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. This book is a lamp that helps us navigate a very dark and wicked world. Now, we know from Joseph, too, that that doesn't mean our path is going to be easy. Just because Joseph was given this full-length coat, just because Joseph had these dreams and God's hand was upon him, didn't mean that his life was going to be easy. Certainly, at this point, Joseph had no idea the how of God's plan that he was going to be thrown into a ditch and he was going to be sold to the Midianites and he was going to be shackled in, in, in prison and forgotten about for two years. And so this plan was going to come with great pain. But ultimately he would be exalted. No different than David had gone through great pain before he became a king. God doesn't build a king through all the circumstances being right. He builds it many times through adversity. And so he does with our lives, right? He builds us through adversity much better than he does through blessing. And so we see this in the life of Joseph. Matthew Henry says this, God has ways of preparing his people beforehand for the trials which they cannot foresee. God has ways of preparing his people beforehand for the trials which they cannot foresee, but which he has an eye on in the comforts with which he furnishes them. So God not only leads us through the trials, but has prepared us for those trials. And we have a lot of those in this room this morning, don't we? We got a text two days ago about Mitzpah and Zulu, or or Mitzra and Zulu, their father-in-law is struggling for his life right now in Tampa because he got hit by a truck. We had another text about a young girl who has her eyes crossed, and we weren't sure what the MRI would reveal on Thursday. We have another gentleman who has his toes in jeopardy because of some complications from diabetes. And it just, the list goes on and on. I have a friend who called and had another brother in Christ in San Antonio whose son was struck and killed by a car, driven by a wife coming back from dropping their daughter off at Baylor. So one family loses a wife and mother. Another family loses a 30-year-old son who had just come back from his wife or from his girlfriend's parents for the first time. And so we have these heavy, heavy burdens. 
but the Lord prepares us in advance for those, and the Lord walks us through those. And as we do what Joseph did, keep our eyes upon him, he makes those ways passable, and he builds our faith in the midst of them. And so we come to verse 9 through 11 in Act 3, the final act this morning. Verse 9, and then he had yet another dream and informed his brothers of it and said, behold, I have had yet another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. So these two dreams, as I said earlier, in rapid succession confirm not only what the Lord will do, but the speed at which he will do it, meaning it's coming quickly. This is another obvious interpretation, the same as the first, but this one involves his parents. And so Jacob understood. In verse 10, it says this, he also told it to his father as well as his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Am I and your mother and your brothers actually going to come and bow down to the ground before you? And so as we think about these two dreams, it's fair to say perhaps Jacob or Joseph was a little immature. Perhaps he was somewhat naive as as a youth and maybe a little unwise as to tell these two dreams to his family. But he certainly had a strong sense of obligation to give them this divine message. And so Joseph does this out of a heart and a love for the Lord. His brothers hated the dreams as much as they hated Joseph. And if you recall back in verse 8, just a a couple verses ago, they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And it sort of reminds us of evangelism, doesn't it? If any of us in this room have done any evangelism for any period of time, It's very rare that you find someone who is excited about the things that you tell them right off the bat, right? That that they're a sinner, that Christ is a great savior, that there is a day of judgment coming. I mean, that's that's not palatable for most people to take in the first dose. And so like evangelism, many times we're hated for our words and we're hated for the things that we say because of what the scriptures say. Man does not like that. There's many things in the scriptures that I did not like when I was introduced to to the Bible for the first time. And so it's no different today. Men hate the revelation of God, oftentimes because it exposes the reality of their sin. And so it's no different here with with his brothers. In Genesis chapter 37, as I mentioned earlier in verse 20, they say, let's come and kill him. Let's throw him into a pit. And we'll say a vicious animal devoured him. And then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. You can't understate the wickedness of his brothers. There's no way to understate how wicked what they're talking about is. And I think that the lesson here is that the the fruit of what we see is because of the root within these brothers. You will know a man, Jesus said, by what? their fruit. And so these men are wicked at this point. And what they're doing and contemplating doing to Joseph is incredibly wicked. But here's the wonderful thing about it. They're doing exactly what the Lord God had planned from all eternity. It's no different than what Paul says or Peter says that when he preaches his great sermon in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, he basically says the same thing. You, by lawless hands, crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. That's man's responsibility. They were wicked in their act, killing the God of the universe in flesh. But he says it was all according to the predetermined plan of God. And so God's ways are inscrutable. He uses the sin of man to praise him. So I don't know what's happened in your life or what God has been doing in your life, but know this, it's never going to be as bad as killing God, crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ. What was the worst thing that's ever been perpetrated in this world? Killing Christ. What's the greatest thing that's ever happened in this world? The killing of Jesus Christ. And so it is here with Joseph. Doesn't matter what they do to their brother, they're accomplishing God's plan. Now, Joseph would have said, hey, can I... Can I change that plan? Can I, can I do this a little easier? And so too would we. But how often of, how many of us have heard someone say cancer was the greatest thing that ever happened to me? 
or that car accident was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because if I hadn't had that, I wouldn't have woken up to my desperate need of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see here the fruit of these men is because of the wickedness of their root. Donald Gray Barnhouse says this, how unfortunate it is that many are not willing to take the place which God has assigned them in this world. Let me say that again. How unfortunate that many are not willing to take the place which God has assigned them in this world. When a man is covetous or envious, he is saying, God, I am not satisfied that you did not give me what I want. Such a man would dethrone God. And Jesus said it this way in John 15. The world hates you. Know that it has hated me before it hated you. But this has happened so that the word that is written in their law will be fulfilled. They hated me for no reason. The issue with Joseph was twofold. Number one, they hated him because he was different. They hated him because he was different. As I said earlier, his virtue exposed their vice. And the second thing is they hated him because he was chosen. They hated him because he was chosen, which is another reason why he's a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 11, and finally, his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. This word jealous is simply defined as this. It's ill will occasioned by another's good fortune. You hate the fact that somebody else has good fortune. It was fascinating this week. I was sitting in my office, and out of the blue, one of the younger kids, in the, I shouldn't say kids. He's 25. He's a kid to me. But he came into my office, and he played soccer at uh, UNC, and then he went on and played in the MLS. And he said, hey, I saw your post on LinkedIn about Sam Bennett winning the, the U.S. Amateur. He goes, my, my parents and I were floored. I'm like, floored about what? He said, well, you don't understand. He said, when I played at UNC... All we did, it seemed like, was battle for playing time. He said, I found out a year and a half in that there were parents lobbying the coach and there were kids lobbying the coach and everybody was battling on playing time. And if a kid didn't score a goal, they were happy because they got yanked and I got to play. And he said, it wasn't about team and winning. He said, the women's team is so great because they stand and they cheer and they genuinely want each other's good, good success. So, but that wasn't the case with us. He goes, there was just all this infighting. And he said, to see a parent on a team be genuinely happy for another kid on that same team is just something that's so radically unknown to us, we just were impressed. And so that's the way the world is. Jealousy runs amok. We're genuinely upset when somebody else is put in some place that we wish we were. And so this is what it is with Joseph. These brothers hated his position and they were jealous of him, and it occasioned their anger because of his good fortune. So we need to guard against jealousy. James, the brother of Jesus, says it this way in James 3.16, for, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, notice this, there is disorder and every evil thing. This word jealousy is the very thing that's going to give birth to what takes place later in this chapter. And so Jacob is somewhat confused and unclear, I'm sure, but he takes this matter to heart about what his son is saying. And so he may not understand all the details and how it's going to unfold, but he puts it in the back of his mind for a rainy day. And Joseph's brothers could not prevent the fulfillment of these dreams. Despite throwing him in a ditch, despite selling him to the Midianite traders, despite being forgotten in prison, all of the things that happened in Joseph's life, God was knitting a silk purse with a pig's ear, because you cannot change God's will. You can deny the Bible, you cannot read the Bible, you can trample upon the Bible, you can hate the Bible, but you're not going to change God's plan. Jesus Christ came to die, he redeemed a people for himself, and he is absolutely accomplishing that purpose. And one day he's going to roll it up in a scroll, and he's going to set his foot back upon this earth, and he's going to take those people to himself. <laughs> And man will never change that. What God has planned, God will fulfill. We cannot frustrate the will of God and God's word. God's word endures forever.
So says the psalmist, your word, O Lord, is settled in heaven forever. And so the primary thing for us here at Trinity Bible Church is and always will be God's word, because that is what changes lives. And so as I close, I want to make some points of application about the most important thing in the Joseph narrative, and that is this. There is maybe no other figure in Scripture that is a more close approximation of the Lord Jesus Christ than Joseph. He is one of the greatest types that is found in all of Scripture. In fact, I argue to say, believe it or not, A.W. Pink has 101 ways that Joseph is like Christ. Now, the good news is I'm not going to take you through those, okay? (laughs) But I want to leave you with five as we close. I want to leave you with five. Number one, Joseph and Christ are both alike in that they are the object of their father's love. They are both the object of their father's love. Both at the baptism and at the transfiguration, the father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. In him, I am well pleased. And I remember as a baby Christian, I thought to myself, if the Lord Jesus Christ is the apple of the father's eye, I better be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there's nothing in, uh, of me that's of any value or of any lovability. That's not even a word. It's Jesus Christ who the Father loves. And so if you're loved by God, you're only loved in the person of Jesus Christ. Number two, Joseph and Jesus both had a commission from their father. Both Christ and Joseph had a commission from their father. Joseph was sent to preserve a nation. As we saw in Psalm 105, he was sent on ahead to preserve that nation. And Jesus Christ, the author, Paul says to the Galatians, in the fullness of the times, in chapter 4, verse 4, in the fullness of the time, God sent forth, God sent him forth, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those under the law and bring them to the adoption of sonship. And so Jesus Christ came to die, and he had a commission from his father to save his elect. Number three, both were rejected by their own people. Both were rejected by their own people. Joseph, obviously, we saw, was rejected by his brothers. We'll continue to see that. Jesus Christ was rejected by the Jews, who he came for and was one of. It says in John 1, 11 and 12, he came to his own And his own people did not accept him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Number four, both are alike in their humiliation. Both are alike in their humiliation. Joseph was sold into slavery. And so too the Lord Jesus Christ came as a servant in the likeness of men, ultimately to be the representative and substitutionary sacrifice, dying as a common criminal between two thieves. And he was obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. And so Jesus Christ, we see in the the New Testament, his great humiliation, just like we saw with Joseph. And finally, five, that's not the final word on either one, because both men are alike in their exaltation. Jesus and Joseph are both alike in their exaltation. Joseph, while he was humiliated, sold into captivity, yet by the grace of God, became the second in command and in charge of all of the grain of Egypt to save not only the nation of Egypt, but ultimately the nation of Israel and the seed of Messiah. So too, Jesus Christ, after being crucified, was raised from the dead and is exalted to the right hand of God the Father. And one of these days is going to appear again a second time, apart from sin, unto salvation. So we see that in the book of Philippians, the the great kenosis and the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as I close, perhaps there's somebody, perhaps there's somebody here this morning who by the providence of God, his invisible hand has brought you into this auditorium to hear the word of God and maybe hear the word of God for the first time. And I would ask that you understand the great privilege, not to hear me, but to hear the word of God and to hold the the word of God, the treasure of his revelation in your hand. And I plead with you, if you have rejected the word of God up to this point in your life, if you have hated what the word of God says, or even hated some of what the word of God says, and you're like Thomas Jefferson, who likes the good parts and doesn't like the bad parts, 
We take God's word in totality or we don't take God's word at all. And so I would plead with you to put down your weapons, forsake your excuses, and bow the knee to the only one who can save you. Don't reject the Lord Jesus Christ like these brothers rejected their brother Joseph. Jesus Christ came to die and purchase his elect, cleanse them, justify them, adopt them into the family of God in his blood. No matter what you've done, his blood can make the phallus clean. So believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Trust him. He's the only mediator among men by which we must be saved. There is salvation in no one else but Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this account of the life of Joseph, and we're excited as we walk through this the coming months. Pray that you would uh, be glorified in your word and that you would teach us well from it. Lord, I pray for any who are here who do not know Christ, that you would give them a heart to understand, eyes to see, ears to hear, remove the scales from their eyes. Might they, might they be believing this day? And we pray for each of us who are here that we would understand the great privilege of being born again and that we would be grateful even again this morning as we take the Lord's Supper and remember the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. We pray in his name, amen. As we transition to the Lord's Supper, I want to go back to that verse that Matt used that tied God's revelation to Joseph to the Lord Jesus Christ. Matt read it. It's Hebrews 1, starting in verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the Father in the prophets in many portions in many ways, those were the dreams and the visions that Matt talked about, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, he is the, he, Christ, is the radiance of his, the Father's glory, the exact representation of his nature. He upholds all things by the word of his power. When he, Christ, made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, because it was finished. The Lord Jesus Christ gave us two ordinances in the church to observe. One is baptism. We observed it about a month ago. The testimony of the changed life, what the Lord has done, it's a testimony to all those around of the saving grace of God. The second is the Lord's Supper, which we, which we will uh, observe today. It's interesting to consider why the Lord has given us the Lord's Supper as a memorial, as a remembrance to do often. Number one, we are to do it often because we forget. We lose focus. We get distracted by the things of this world. The ordinance is given to the church. The ordinance is given to believers. There is no saving power in the ordinance. It represents the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as believers, we are to take it in a worthy manner. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, the very famous passage where Paul talks about what he received, in verse 27, he says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever eats and drinks judge, judgment to himself, if he does not judge his body rightly. We are going to have a moment in between when the men are passing out the bread, the emblems, the bread and the grape juice, to reflect. We are to approach the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. And he has given us this for several reasons. It is a reminder that we've been, what we've been purchased with. As a believer, you and I have been purchased with the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been 
purchased with the most costly thing that there is in this world. And if we're purchased, the second thing that it reminds us of is that we owe him our life. We're no longer our own. We're united with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is so encouraging to you and to me because it should remind us and encourage us to try to live lives that are pleasing and acceptable to the one who purchased us. This is, we are to take this as a spiritual benefit. It's a spiritual nourishment that as we live our daily lives, we focus on what is important in our lives. For the believer, life is wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ. The thing that ties us together as a people is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I just want to read a couple verses. The men will come forward. I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23. Paul says, For I receive from the Lord, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. Gentlemen, would you pass out the bread? represents the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. This takes us to the cross where he gave his body for his people. It takes us to the cross and it tells us and reminds us that he died in our place. And not only did he die in our place, he was the one that was uniquely qualified to do so. He had to become a man and so as John 1.14 told us, tells us, he became flesh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But he had to do something that we couldn't do. He had to live a perfect life. He had to f- live perfectly under God's law. And only God could do that. He is uniquely qualified because he is the God-man. 
This is the one that has purchased the salvation of his people. So let's take the bread together. Dear Lord, we are in awe that you sent your son, as Matt said, the son that you loved, the, the, the son of your favored position, the one that was eternally in your bosom, and you sent him and commissioned him to be the savior of your people. Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 Corinthians 11:25 In the same way he the Lord Jesus Christ took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes so the men will come forward and pass the cup This cup of grape juice represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for the sins of his people. In order to pay for sins, there had to be blood. Life is in the blood. There is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. There's the picture of the bema seat between the cherubim. That on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in, the law of God is underneath, and it is covered in blood, the blood of the Lamb. And so when the Father looks at us, he looks at his people, he doesn't see you and me. He sees us covered in the righteous blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist saw the Lord Jesus Christ coming to him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let's take the grape juice together. <laughs> 
Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that your Son, Christ, died for all of our sins. He died for all the sins of all of his people, that you died for, that he died for our sins past, present, and future, that you have made total provision for your people through your Son. We thank you and praise you. In Christ's name, amen. a foundation. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for a great message. It was great for unpacking the Word of God like that. The story of Joseph is so exciting. I know you don't want to miss what's coming up. Love it. And I love the fact that you brought up that Joseph is the typology of Christ. There's so many types of Christ. And what's amazing to me is that all of Scripture points to Jesus Christ. Everything from the Old Testament pointing towards Christ, the New Testament pointing back to Christ, the pinnacle of the Word of God is Jesus Christ. And when we look at all that, I don't know about you, but I know that it tells me I want to make sure I'm on board. I want to make sure I'm on board 110% with what our Lord is doing in Jesus Christ. And that's what's so exciting. That's what we see in Scripture. These brothers, they weren't on board, and they didn't get anywhere. But all of us who are on board with Christ, we're headed to the promised land and where the Lord wants us. So, Matt, thanks again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ, who you would so graciously send into this world to take on human flesh, to walk where we walk to live a perfect life and then go to that cross and die and be put to death by these wicked men and yet, as Matt said, to be used as the greatest event that ever occurred in history that you would provide the way of escape. The way of escape 
of your condemnation and eternal hell is by placing our trust in Jesus who took our sins, who substituted for us, who went away ahead of us like Joseph did to prepare a way that we could be reunited with you. And so, Father, if there's any here today has been mentioned that have not done that, we pray that they would do that and that those of us who have accepted and trusted you as our Lord and Savior, that we would be even more committed to live a life as a light in this dark world and one that would be pleasing to you. Thank you again for this service and for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.